Okay, so I want to do a real quick video on a more hypothetical aspect of what data structures are, kind of why we want to use them, what they're for, and kind of just answer the question that a lot of people leave this class having of why did I learn any of what I just learned. A lot of people go through the class and they'll learn kind of what they are, they'll learn how to implement them, and maybe learn kind of what you can do with them. But a lot of the questions I'll ask is why, why do I care? Why did I learn any of that? What is the purpose? Et cetera, et cetera. And I kind of want to address that and answer that question with a really short video. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. And one sec. Okay. So what are data structures? Well, here's a graph of them. You can see data structures right here. We have two main types. We have the primitive data structures over here, and we have non-primitive over here, and some variances of all those. So we're going to start, obviously, with primitive data structures. So if you look here, we have integers, floats, characters, booleans. Obviously, there's going to be more, but you might recognize those under another name of data types. So data types are kind of the building blocks of what we do with programming languages. So like maybe you've seen integers or double booleans of four, so maybe you've seen like int x equals five, something like this, maybe uh, float y equals 7.2, so on and so forth. So while these are data types, at their basis they are still data structures. They're very, very primitive, very, very simplistic, but at the end of the day, they are still some way that we structure data. The data in this case, however, are simple ones and zeros that make up the numbers that we are trying to create. So in this case, we have some integer, and while that means something to us as humans, that really doesn't mean anything to a computer. Computer is just going to read in ones and zeros, and that is it. But for this, this is telling a telling a computer how to formulate those ones and zeros into something that's meaningful to us. So let's say we have in x equals five. That's going to store the value of five in that memory location. Whereas float y, now this has some data structure that allows for floating point operations and arithmetic, so you can actually store decimal values. So with that being said, we also have things like doubles, and that would be floating point, but for a larger swath of numbers. So they have some specific sizes that you might be familiar with, uh, whether it be four bytes, single byte for characters, um, single bits for booleans and stuff like that. And there are times to use them based on what you're doing. So obviously if you're wanting to be a little more space conscious, you'll use a float for floating point. But if you need something of really large data and you're not too worried about eating up a lot of space and memory, then you can use doubles. Now, while we do associate them with specific sizes in terms of bytes, that is going to be specified by what language, compiler, computer architecture, and a few other things that you're using. So most of the time you'll see, I think integers is like four bytes in most languages, but that might not always be the case. Especially if you use like short integers or long integers, those are gonna have some variations and deviations based on your current specification. So something to keep in mind, there is a, uh, a link down here, C++ data types, I'm pretty sure it takes you to a tutorial point page that I actually find pretty useful. I'll keep that linked in the description below as well. If you have the PDF of this, then it's obviously a link you can click on and it'll take you to it. But if you're just watching this, then I'll make sure to keep the link. Now, moving on from that, we go to the more important part for this course, non-primitive data structures. We have two specific kinds. We have linear data structures and non-linear data structures. Before we get to those, what are non-primitive data structures? So, these are more abstract and typically they're going to be user-defined. Now, what I mean by user-defined is we create the specification, how they interact, and I'll explain that in just a second. But for those that are not user-defined, we have some pretty common ones with arrays, 
vectors of use in C++, maps, you might have also recognized them in Python as dictionaries, and a few other things. So I think sets are also one, but this is C++, we have arrays, vectors, maps, stuff like that. And these are already defined in the language. You might have to import a library or something. I think most of these are in the actual standard library, so no big deal there. I guarantee almost everybody, if not everybody, has used the arrays in some format. These are all, well, these two are contiguous linear data structures, meaning that you specify where they are, and it's just going to continue adding another say data type right after one after another. So let's say we have int, we want five of them, so an array of five integers. That'd be five integers directly in a row in memory, and it's gonna handle that for you. Maybe it's a, like address, I don't know, 800, the next one would be at 804, and 808, and so on and so forth. And we did floats for vectors. We might be able to do say a float at one point in memory, followed by another one, and another one and with vectors we have a little bit more flexibility so we can start adding new ones to the end of it and you get a bit more flexibility by having dynamic sized lists and stuff maps that's a little bit more complicated and we'll talk about that maybe later but for these these are going to be very very simplistic uh, uh, non-user defined data structures now with user defined, and this is gonna be what we do in this course, we have stuff like stacks and queues. Those are actually defined in C++, but we're gonna make our own and link lists, which is gonna be the most simplistic form of our user defined data structures. They're gonna be based on node classes. You might have also seen a struct, so I have like an integer with a pointer, and or the pointer and the pointer. So I have three of these. These pointers are going to point to the next node, point to the next node. This will point to something. Currently it doesn't point to anything. This will be a singly linked list. We have some starting point here. It's going to point to the next node. It's going to point to the next node. We can add another one here with an integer with a pointer. Now it points to the next node, so on and so forth. I'll discuss that more later, but essentially we've decided, we've defined a starting point for our data and we just continue to add on. Now we wanted to, since we defined the specification of this data structure, we can add more functionality to it. So maybe we want to have two pointers in here. And we want to now say that they point to the previous one as well. So now it has a direction of forwards and backwards. And now we have, let's just start and end, but more of just some point of beginning and ending in a way but we can continue to add on to both sides if we wanted to, so on and so forth, and keep on adding. So essentially with the user-defined ones, the only difference here we're gonna do is kind of change the restrictions on how we interface with these data structures. We can make it as complex as we want to, or as simple as we want to. And it's kind of the beauty of these non-primitive data structures. We can define them however we want to. Now, we only went over the linear data structures right there. And that's going to be array, stack, queue, linked list, so on and so forth. And what I mean by linear here is they only have really one specific goal. And that is just to kind of list together very similar data. So with arrays, you saw we had a bunch of integers kind of string together. With floats, we had a bunch of floats strung together for vector. And then for that linked list that I did, it was an integer with some pointers, but every single one of those nodes ended up having the same data inside of them. There was just a linked list of those classes. Now, that's really good and very, very useful for a lot of reasons. A little bit simplistic and can't do a whole lot with it, but that is actually a good thing in this case, is just kind of keeping it simple there. Now, Beyond linear data structures, we have nonlinear data structures. We'll talk about those in just a second, but they're a little bit more complicated. Now, for linear, that's going to be for us linked lists, stacks, 
and Q's. Oops. Now, obviously, we've already gone over arrays and vectors, previous classes, and all that. But for these, you might have seen them before. I linked a list. We went over it previously. A stack is essentially going to be a linked list with a specific restriction of LIFO, while a Q is going to be linked with a specific restriction of FIFO. So we basically change the paradigm of how we interface with these data structures and it gives us a different form of functionality, but it gives us a very specific form of functionality and that's going to tie into the nonlinear data structures in just a bit. So yes, we could just continue to add on to our functionality and make it more complex and add in new um, architecture to it. So we saw we did the singly linked list previous. We had just an integer and a single pointer. We added another pointer that pointed the previous one. And essentially, we made a doubly linked list and essentially taking our basis of linked list and expanding upon that. If we wanted to add maybe an integer and a string, we can kind of set up like almost a dictionary with a second like associative array or sorts. And yes, you can continue to just add on new functionality and make a more complicated structure. And yes, you could technically implement a stack using linked list, but in this case, that's going to be expensive on our memory, expensive on resources, whenever we could just strip away a lot of that functionality and still get everything that we need, but it's going to be more memory efficient. And it's gonna be a little more straightforward in how we interface with that class that we'll make. So this is one of the beauties with linear data structures is their simplicity. So we can make it as complicated as we want to, but we can also strip away some of that complication and give ourselves a more straightforward approach of what we are trying to do. And they see that very frequently with stacks. Cues, um, cues are like a line, so basically if something goes in, something comes out, just like you would like a, a drive through at a restaurant or something. Stacks, you see that very frequently with low-level memory. Linked list, very, very helpful. Like, say you're in a more primitive language like C, where you don't have some like vectors, you can create some other dynamic list of your own and add as much functionality as you want, and it's very helpful in that case. Moving on, we'll get to our nonlinear data structures. Now, these, these are going to be very complex in structure and behavior, but they're complex in the sense that they have a very specific functionality. Some of them aren't very, very difficult to understand, especially some might say a tree, where you just have some root node here. It'll have some children. Those children have some children. You can see what I mean by nonlinear. See the previous ones, we just had this, and it went to the next one, so on and so forth. With a tree here, it's not linear, so we can go down the left path, the right path, left path, right path, but let's say that we had a, we were looking for the number eight. And eight was located here, but eight was located, say here, over here. So this is guaranteed it's gonna take us one trip, two trip, three trip, four trip. But this one, let's say we go on the left path, we go here, here it's not there, and here that's gonna be our third or fourth trip essentially so it's not a great example because it's very short but essentially we have a non-linear approach to parse data it's going to be potentially more optimal but on average it will definitely be more optimal now with graphs it's another one that was on the graph that we had so we have we want to find the shortest path somewhere so we definitely have a nonlinear approach here. And we just want to find the shortest path from point A to point B, essentially. And let's say that we had that here, that here, that here. I want to find the path from, say, uh, this node to like this node. Well, we can sit there and start counting the number of vertices. We have to actually traverse. We have like one here, two here, three here, four here. That'd be four. We're going to do one, two, three, four. So these are both pretty good. I think that's going to be about it. So you have two different things here, but we still have a nonlinear approach essentially. But this is all going to be 
in a specific data structure. So all of these nodes are going to have their neighbors associated. So this is a very good example of a more complex data structure that has a specific use case, very good use case, but is definitely a lot more complicated than our humble linked list. So again, these are going to be complex in nature and behavior, but again, they have a very specific purpose. So these aren't general purpose ones, as opposed to say our arrays and our vectors, our linked lists and stacks and stuff. Those are more general purpose uh, data structures. Once you start hitting nonlinear, they're going to be more designed to optimize and improve algorithms and stuff like that. So those are kind of the use cases of all of these various data structures, ranging from our primitive to our linear, nonlinear, user defined, stuff like that. Now, with that being said, I do hope that answers the question of why do we learn these things? What are they for? Where does it kind of start from? What a data structure actually is because a lot of people just go into it and think okay data structure is basically just a linked list a vector uh, stacks maybe they get into binary search tree stuff like that because they're very commonly taught in the course however it starts way earlier in programming paradigms of what a data structure is it goes down to the very very humble integer maybe a boolean it's just some way that we construct some form of data that makes sense to us that we can tell a computer hey I want you to do this specific operation with this specific type of data. I want it to be structured in a way that is consistent. So with integers, it's always going to be, say for C++, that way we always do it, it's going to be four bytes of data. So it can range from, say, I think it's like negative 32,000. I forget the number off the top of my head. It's like negative 32,000 to positive 32,000 in that range. So it's four bytes of range, unless we want signed or unsigned. So that tells us we go from potential negative values to nothing but positive. So essentially, it's some way that we structure our data. And that can be extended to floating points for floats and doubles. And then maybe we want to extend it to lists of data. So for like arrays or vectors and stuff like that. So data structures are very, very broad in what they are. But for this class, we're going to go to more user-defined ones because that teaches you how we came up with all these data structures and why we came up with them. Because sometimes maybe you want to create some entirely new class that has some consistency to it. So maybe you need to implement a specific type of doubly linked list for something. So you can create that class based on a very, very standard doubly linked list and then extend your functionality as much as you want. So that's kind of the point of what all this class is. And it's very easy to miss the purpose of this class. A lot of people think of it as just advanced programming, and it is, but there is a rhyme to the reason. And I hope that I did a good job explaining that. I hope you learned something. That's gonna be it for me for right now. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.